one pattern I've noticed, which is teams that are really close and they trust each other, they can talk about the problems, they tend to go a long way together and the founders tend to stick on the journey together. The second one is mission, right? If, if they have a clear mission and they're doing, they're very clear about why they're doing this for a purpose larger than that of just serving themselves. If you have a mission that you are living for, that you're fighting for, that's larger than yourself, then that will give you the motivation to keep going when things are tough. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Au, venture capitalist, serial founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 20,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.braveseaa.com. Poland is a private B2B liquidation marketplace. The startup connects sellers carrying excess inventory with bulk buyers across the world. The platform incorporates pricing algorithms, dashboard analytics, and sustainability metrics to find great liquidation outcomes. Hundreds of tons of usable products that would have been incinerated or gone to landfill is now used by happy consumers instead. Manufacturers get more revenue, buyers get cheaper inventory, and the world benefits. Learn more at www.poland.tech. Hey, Oswald. Really excited to have you on the show. We've known each other for, what, a dozen years now? Yeah, it's been uh, many years. I uh, still remember the old co-working space and at Impact Hub Singapore. And at the Hub, at the Rick Bus, yeah. We were both in the newspaper at the same time as well for being <laughs> entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah, you, you were there for a better reason. I was there for being Singaporean parents' worst nightmares. Dropping out of school <laughs> to do a startup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great to catch up today, Jeremy. How have you been? Yeah, no, it's good. I think it's just been a wonderful month, but definitely lots of ups and downs. But I, I'd love for you to introduce yourself real quick. Sure. Hey, okay. Hi, everyone. Oswald here from Glint. So, founder and CEO, we started the company officially about seven years ago. In 2015, that was when we launched the platform. When we first started the company, my co-founders and I were still going to college in the US, and we thought that we could juggle both the startup and our studies. That turned out to be a terrible idea. So six months in, decided to drop out from school in the US and come back to Singapore to build the company. That was when Straits Times called us Singaporean parents' worst nightmares. That was something that I was very proud about. I showed my parents. And the first few years were a struggle. This was not only our first company, but really our first job. Right. So the first three years, we're trying to find product market fit, went through lots of pivots, almost died three times as a company. And it was only until about 2018, 2019, where we found the right business model and the business I've to take off there. So today, we're one of the largest talent platforms in Southeast Asia. We serve over four and a half million users in the, in the region to help them grow in their careers. Over 50,000 employers use us to grow their teams. And our mission is really to help realize human potential for the professionals in Southeast Asia. Yeah, so you said with a moment of pride, right, that your parents' worst nightmare, and I think that's hilarious. <laughs> I definitely told my parents about dropping out once or twice to do startups, and they were not happy, And but I decided to, to stick to school. So how do you feel about that? Was it scary when you saw that article? Were you happy? Were you just hits down building? What was going through your head? We were, I think we were very much hits down building. I think, but I think at the beginning of our journey, there was also a bit of too much interest in the press from our side. Like we would, we were overly obsessed, I think at the beginning with, with press. And whenever there was good press, we are like, oh, this is like a highlight of the day, highlight of the week. Because we didn't know that, we didn't know what really mattered, right? When we first started out, that it's not about getting press, it's about getting traction, it's about building a great product. And so when we first started, press stories like that excited us. But looking back, you know, those were really not the most important things. Today, what's most important for us is not the external validation, but really what we have built internally. And what I'm most satisfied about, it's always seeing our own people grow with us, seeing the business grow, rather than things like press stories. 
fully. Yeah. Yeah, I think all of us were very young 12 years ago. So I yeah. would, you know, I think Seven. I was yeah. also quite, <laughs> <laughs> I was also interested yeah. in all this press and all this other yeah. stuff. And so from there, you, you decided to keep going, right? Which was the interesting part, right? Like you dropped out, you were building and it was a struggle. So could you share a little bit more about why you were struggling in that first situation? I remember it was an internship matching platform. Yeah. And a lot of, I remember back then also, I think someone was telling me, I was like, is there any money in matching interns? Yeah. Uh, very little. And, but you were all very confident. <laughs> yeah. You were very confident at that time that it was a good approach. So walk us through a little bit about the struggle, right? Because, you know, there you are saying it makes sense. You went to press for it, and then but you're also realizing that was very difficult. There wasn't very much money in it, right? So what was it like that flavor? Yeah, yeah it certainly was difficult at the beginning because we we didn't know what we're doing, right? This was not only our first company, but really our first job, and it was difficult for a few reasons. First is we had no experience, and second is because we had no experience, we chose a really small market, and third, we chose the wrong business model. So to give a sense of how little experience we had, when we closed our first sale as a company, we didn't know what to do next. And someone told us that we should send a customer an invoice. And we asked the, the investor, what's the invoice? <laughs> and that was how little experience we had, right? And, and we're very fortunate to then have continued learning from great mentors and investors over the next few years that help us plug the gap. But the second thing that we, we didn't get right at the beginning was the market. We chose a really small market, which is such an internship market in Singapore, which is by itself already a very small market. And, and so even though we got a bit of traction up front, it was really difficult to grow after we hit a certain saturation point. And the third thing was the monetization. In terms of business model, we tried many different things at the beginning and we were all, always just focused on getting user growth, but not really revenue growth. And that affected our ability to scale eventually because there's only that amount of traction you can get just by relying on investor funding if you are not really building a proper revenue generating and profit generating business. Right. So at the beginning, we're only we're thinking that we're going to charge students for, for helping them find internships. Quickly learned that they were not our customers. Customers should be employers. And then we spoke to employers and we learned that it shouldn't just be interns. They, they actually have a much bigger problem than just looking for interns. And over it took us this whole iteration process, took us three to four years to really get right. Eventually chose a much bigger market, Indonesia, cross-border recruiting, remote hiring eventually evolved the business model as well beyond just internships to full-time hires and helping companies build cross-border remote teams. And only then when we chose the right market, did we start to take off. So the market always wins. That's one learning we had. Yeah. And what's interesting is you change geographies, you change business model, and you change your target customer, yeah. right? Um, change everything. <laughs> so you change everything. Is that, so could you walk us through a little bit more about how you went through that product market fit testing, like, was there like a moment that was like a hallelujah moment that made you make it change your mind? Was it research? How did you change your mind, right? Because those are very hard decisions to make. Yeah, a great question. I think it was, what we did was we, of course, went through many iterations. We tried different business models. We did internship matching, we did graduate job recruiting, we did employer branding, we even did white labels. And we tried many different things. I mean, we did placements as well. And because we were just so focused on looking for revenue and generating revenue in many different ways, we were not focused on building in a predictable and scalable way at the beginning. So that was the first learning that we had, which is it's not just about getting users and getting revenue. It's about building a predictable sales engine and a predictable value creation engine that we can keep scaling. And eventually we realized that, hey, all, all of the business models that we had we had one, which was actually in a really huge market, which is core recruiting, right? As well as remote hiring. But we were then confronted with a choice of whether or not to continue all of our other product lines, like white labels, employer branding, internship programs, students exchange program, and a whole lot, right? And it was either we focus on just one thing or we shut down everything else. And what was interesting about that moment was that it was intellectually very simple. What was the right thing to do? Because you have too many product lines, you're not focused, what do you do? You have to focus, right? Focus on one that's working and kill the rest. So intellectually, it was very simple, but I think it just took courage. And that's one thing I learned in, by building a startup so far, which is the most difficult decisions are difficult, not because they take a, a lot of IQ to solve or, or they're intellectually very complicated. They're often very simple. It was very clear what was the right thing to do. It just took courage because the moment we did that, revenue basically plummeted 
for at least one to two quarters. And we had to be accountable to the investors, we had to be accountable to the employees as to why, where the company is going and what we're building, right? And so that was the difficult part, which is plucking up the courage to say no to many different things, focusing on one thing and building that up and scaling that up as a predictable sales engine. So what's interesting is that you were part of JFDI, right? Joyful Frog. Yeah, you know, great days. Uh, Love the days. Mason. Great yeah. days. Yeah. So I think what's interesting is how did you build your community, right? Because I remember that time we were a bunch of weirdos, right? For me, I didn't even dare write founder on my business. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it was not cool. I don't know. <laughs> so it was just always that weird dynamic, right? Yeah. Then. So how did you build that community in the early days? Yeah. Good question. I think at the beginning... JFDI was really one of the turning points for us that plugged us into the ecosystem. Because before that, we were working out of a small office in Mountbatten. It was about the three of us, the co-founders. We're in a, we were in an office that's maybe, that they could fit maybe like two tables. And when we got stuck, we just always got stuck, right? Because it was the three of us. We didn't know what we're doing. We didn't even know what was fundraising. We didn't know what Series A, Series B. And so when we joined JFDI, that was one way of really plugging ourselves into a community because it was, a, it was a very good accelerator program. It was, I think it was one of the first in Southeast Asia. And it plugged us into a community of other like-minded individuals, but more importantly, also mentors. Because this was our first startup. Having mentors was a great way to, to just learn from other people and to know what to do, what not to do. So I remember just hanging out at a cafe at JFDI, meeting so many people. One of them was Darius from 99Co. And we chatted over coffee and 20 minutes later, uh, he decided to invest in us. So it was just serendipitous moments like that, right? It's when you have a, a community of people that just hang out together, it's like-minded. It led to, it led to really, really great outcomes for everyone involved. Yeah. And I think during this early time, we also went through all these near-death experiences. So could you share what the near-death experiences were? <laughs> so many. Uh, Running out of cash many times was, was always a common trigger for near-death experiences, right? So at the beginning, we didn't manage our cash flow well. We were not only looking at, we were looking only at revenue, not looking at cash flow. We weren't projecting our finances well. We were always waiting too long before raising our next fundraise. And, and because of that, we almost ran out of cash multiple times. And I remember one of the times we actually called all the employees all the team members into a, into a room. This was like a month before we were running our funding. And we told everyone that, hey, we had one month of runway there. We wanted to be transparent and upfront with everyone. So you can make a decision as to whether or not you will stay with us in the mission or you'll go. And we'll respect that. Uh, it surprised me. And uh, I was very touched. We were all very touched. They all decided to stay. Right? And many of them are still in the company with us today. And they're now taking on really important roles. They've grown together with the company. And it's really the early team members that, that have helped to build the company to where we are today. Yeah, I think you know, a lot of companies go through that cash flow issue, yeah. right? And for you, you decided to keep going. So what kept you going? Because you, know, you had to go through so many tough times, yeah. right? We've talked about it a little bit as well. You also went through like tough times with investors, in terms of strategy, in terms of approach. So what made you decide to keep going, right? Because I think, I know why you started. Yeah. You started because like you said, you saw the opportunity, you went for it, you dropped yeah. out. You know, that, that's easy, right? But I think the re reason why you start something is always different from why you continue doing yeah. it, right? And you went through so many near-death experiences. So why did you keep going? Yeah, great question. I think it's really the people and the mission. So for me, I'm motivated by growth and impact. Those, those are my values. So as long as I'm growing and as long as I'm making an impact, then I feel really motivated to keep going no matter how hard it is or no matter how difficult it is. So in terms of growth, why I've really enjoyed about journey, our journey so far is even though we've been doing this officially now for seven, almost eight years, it feels like every six to seven months, I have a new job because the company is growing quickly and what is required of me to, in order to take the company to the next level changes all the time because it requires different skill sets to lead a company of 100 people compared to 200 people compared to now 800 people. So I'm growing and I'm learning from great mentors, great investors along the way, from our fellow team members as well. So that's the first reason I'm growing. And the second one is really impact. So I feel really fortunate that we started a company in the human capital space and our mission is to help realize human potential. 
And so now we know that every month, millions of people are using the platform to look for their careers, where we're facilitating millions of job applications. And so every day that we're working, we're making a real impact on people's careers. That's on our users and customers. And equally important is also on our own team members. Right? One of my favorite moments, it's, it's not just about raising rounds of funding or, or growing revenue. Those are great. But it's really seeing early team members that have grown together with us. Some of them join us as fresh graduates or join us with one year of experience, but are now leading teams of a few hundred people. right? And they've grown up together with us. And just seeing people grow together with us, it's, it's really rewarding. So ultimately, growth and impact is what kept me going no matter how hard it is. You know, how did you make the shift and decision to go from Singapore to Indonesia? So the product side makes sense, right? Because you're looking for more profitable, more recurring revenue streams. But Singapore to Indonesia is not necessarily the most intuitive, right? You could have gone to Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam. So what was that experience like making a decision to go to Indonesia? And how did you go about doing it? Yeah, I, I wish I could give you a very intelligent answer of like market mapping and research that we did. But it was really, it was really luck. I think we, at the first expansion market we chose, we got lucky. We just thought, hey, is this the biggest market, biggest population? We had some local partners that we knew there. So let's, let's, let's just try it, right? And it started to take off. So we, we got really lucky. Eventually, when we did our second and third market expansion, it was when we got a little bit more experience and we started to map out who were our early adopters. In our case, we realized that a lot of our early adopters were startups or companies in the tech ecosystem. And so we're comparing back then, for example, between Vietnam and Philippines. And this was about three years ago. And we realized that the tech ecosystem in Vietnam was actually more mature than it was in Philippines about three years ago. There was more startups that were re ready to hire tech talent. And so we then chose Vietnam over Philippines. So it was looking at who our early adopters were. And of course, a combination of market size and market growth rates. But in the very, very first instance in Indonesia, it was just market size and we got lucky. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of companies obviously expand to Indonesia, right? So from the US, from Vietnam, from Singapore. So what was some of the myths and misconceptions about entering the market like Indonesia? Yeah. yeah, I think one of the biggest learnings we had, it's how important it is to be on the ground. The first few months of, of expanding to Indonesia, I was trying to run it from Singapore. And that, was, that didn't work because the iteration loops were too slow. So how it looked like at first was we'll have a call with my country manager there, let's say on, on Monday, right? During the weekly calls. So and we'll have an idea and we'll say, that's a great idea. Let's talk about it during our next call, either end of the week or next week. And so the iteration cycles were then in weeks, which is too slow for a startup. But eventually what we did when I moved over and we're literally sleeping in the same apartment is we're able to speed up iteration cycles from weeks into days, right? We'll have a discussion in the morning. We'll execute in the afternoon. And then at night in the apartment, we'll discuss it again and iterate again at night. And the next day, we'll try again the next, the next model, an improved model. So one of the biggest conceptions or mistakes I see is people trying to expand into a new country remotely. And that's really difficult. That's one thing. Another thing we found is the importance of really using locals for the market. So of course, there's obvious reason of there's an obvious reason of people understand the market, but there was actually a huge cost advantage in recruiting locals as well as compared to as compared to only building our team in Singapore. And that cost advantage eventually translated into faster iteration loops as well. Because in the case of, let's say, building a sales team, when we're building a sales team in Singapore, as a seed stage or a series A funded startup, we could only afford to hire one or two sales manager at a time, right? And if that, does, if that person doesn't work out, where we'll have wasted three months or easily six months. In Indonesia, however, or in Vietnam, we could then build up a team of, we could build up multiple teams of sales managers around multiple sales managers for the sale of our money. And if one of them doesn't work out, we'll have second or third one that will likely work out uh, that we can then continue scaling. So that compressed the iteration loops and allowed us to execute so much faster. Yeah. And what's interesting is that you focus on building out talent, right? So what have been your learnings regarding talent placement and retention in Indonesia, right? Because I think a lot of folks are building Indonesia and or they're curious about it, but I think they say things like, okay, the education levels mm. are rising, yeah. but not there yet. The professional skill set on the job training is not really there mm. yet. I mean, it's not just about Indonesia, right? I think this is an emerging market kind of point yeah. of view from a developed world. 
So what, what have been your learnings about talent and human capital in Indonesia? Yeah, great question. I think one learning building out our teams in the mar emerging market like Indonesia, and it's a pattern we're starting to see in other emerging markets like Vietnam or Philippines as well, is the importance of recruiting early high potential talent who are really smart, really driven, but may not have much experiences, and then investing in them and grooming them as compared to just always trying to look out for the experience hire, that will be a silver bullet, right? In the early days, we were always trying to look out for experience hires that would join our team, especially given the, how, how, how young we were as well. And so we then, we then, we were always looking out for silver bullets and more often than not, those always didn't work out. Whether it's for culture fit reasons or whether it's for many execution reasons, right? Even they might be a good culture fit, but the context that they were coming from was just so different. In the early days, what worked really well was then just having fresh graduates or people with one or two years of experience that were really hungry, really driven. But we invested in them, we coached them, and they grew up together with us. And these people ended up being so much more loyal to the company as well. They really act like owners, and they are owners. We share a part of the company with them via ESOP. That that eventually helps to form the core of the company. So I, I can't help but ask, would you tell your own kids that to drop out of school? How would you help them make a decision on that? I would help them to make a decision by, I think both the heart as well as the head, right? So the heart is you, you got to be sure what you want to do three to five years from now. And for me back then, I was pretty sure that I wanted to be running my own startup. I was always interested in entrepreneurship. And because of that, I knew that I'll be able to learn so much more about being an entrepreneur by really running my own startup than staying in school for the next four years, trying to learn from business professors only, right? So that's the heart of it, which is what do you want to do? Have clarity on that and have the courage to go after it. But at the same time, also having the hate to mitigate the risk. I think for us, we're very lucky. It wasn't a case of just blind bravado because Berkeley, our, both, our, both, both of our university actually gave me infinite deferment. So I can go back today if I wanted to. I could go back when I'm 80. So the risk was actually very well mitigated. Right? If it worked out, great. If it, if it right. didn't, I could have actually gone back to Berkeley. Yeah. Who knows, maybe he'll eventually become an alumnus and hang out with me at the Berkeley alumni events. <laughs> I, actually um... go, I actually go to some <laughs> of the events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's good fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a lot yeah. of fun. So I think it's interesting, right? Because like, how many kids do you have? I have one today. Just turned one. Al almost 32. Almost just turned, wait, I have a two-year-old daughter. Yeah, I think we had daughter. about the same time uh, COVID uh, babies, right? <laughs> yeah, COVID babies and a, and a government bonus. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think what's interesting is that you obviously have a big, big love for education. Obviously, you think about human capital. So when you think about your child and other people's children, what would you think are really important skills or knowledge to know for them to be successful in Southeast Asia in say 20, 30 years from your perspective? I think the first one, and I'm trying to impart this to my son Leo as much as possible, is just learning to learn and the thirst for learning and knowledge and reading books because the world is changing so rapidly that I don't think there's a fixed set of things that that I can say, well, if I learn this, you'll be set for the next 20, 30 years. But I think the meta skill that we should all be equipped with is the ability to learn and adapt to new situations. And one thing that really served us really well over the past few years in starting a startup is the ability to, to reconstruct our mental models, to learn new mental models, to learn from other mentors, to read books, just to take on new challenges, right? So we never had a single set of principles that would say we'll use this for the next five, 10 years, but we're always updating our principles, we're updating our knowledge. And I think that ability to learn and the ability to acknowledge what you don't know and have the desire to learn new things, it's probably what will serve uh, everyone the most. How would you teach someone to learn how to learn from your perspective? I think one, it's really just an interest in reading from reading at the beginning, right? So one thing I'm trying to do for my kids now is to just get them to enjoy reading, read more to them, get them to associate it with, with, with joy. Yeah. 
And I think that's one part of it in terms of a habit. The second is in terms of a mindset. So one thing we have at our company, Glint, it's this value called beginner's mindset, which is the, the humility to acknowledge that you're always less than 1% done. You're always growing. And there's a lot of things out there that you can learn from. And we try to filter for that even in our interviews. We we'll ask questions like, when was the last time someone gave you a negative feedback? And we'll see how people react to that. Some people react to feedback in a really defensive way. Some people react really well. They get reflective and they improve themselves. So, but at the core of it, it really is ego. Because if you are able to put down your ego and reflect and recognize that there are things that you can improve upon, I think that's when that in combination with habits like reading or learning from mentors will bring you very far. Is there anything that you're teaching your kids to learn that you think is like non-mainstream? Like, is there anything that you want them to learn that, you know, <laughs> well, it's different it's, from how other parents would do it? It's two years old now, so uh, <laughs> probably not, not there not, yet. Not but not there yet. Sure but when, when he grows up a little bit more, I'm going to say him for John's uh, classes at Do Me for sure. So you want your kid to learn coding or you want your kid to learn the metaverse or... What's, what's that? I, I would yeah. expose him to as many things as possible, whether it's coding or whether it's arts. And I think having a broad-based education would serve mm. him really well rather than just going really deep and specializing too early. Yeah. So it's expo expose him to different experiences. Yeah. Awesome. Could you share with us a time that you personally have been brave? I think one time was... Uh, when we decided to shut down five out of four of our product lines five, six, five years ago to eventually focus on the single one, which is one of our core product lines today. And like I mentioned earlier, intellectually it was very clear what was the right thing to do. It was intellectually very simple, but it took courage because we knew that revenue would plummet after you shut down four or five of your product lines. And that took courage yeah, from the team. Why was it tough for you? It was tough because we, we felt like we had to put on a certain impression to team members, to investors, that every quarter would be a good quarter at the beginning, right? And when we take decisions like that, it will affect growth in the short term. But when we really thought about it, we realized that what's really important is not just short-term growth, but building an enduring company for the long term. And that gave us a lot more courage and clarity to make these difficult decisions such that even if we had to trade off the short term for the long term, it would be the right decision to do. I think you've obviously, frankly, Oswald, you're much more mature and poised as a speaker compared to a dozen years ago. How did you learn how to kind of like communicate and storytell from your perspective? I think it's just being authentic. <laughs> One thing I've learned is, is just having a, just treat such conversations as, what they are, which is a conversation. I think maybe in the past, I would worry too much about what people would think or uh, what I'm really saying. And I would not be present, right? I would not be distracted. If I'm just super present mm. and get focused on the conversation itself and just have a good, good chat, then I think that helps yeah. and go a long way. What do you read? What do you read? One is for work and one for fun. For work, the latest book that I'm reading now... I think I have it here. This is pretty good. So principles, but this is not the core principles. It, it's not the one that everyone knows. This is a journal. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, so it's like a guided journal. You can read through it, but more importantly, it prompts you to reflect. And that's one thing that I found really important in, in running a company, which is having clarity. So it's like a, it's a book, but it's a guided journal as well. So that helps. For fun, I'm yeah. reading some philosophy books. It's called The Book of Five Rings. It was written by a samurai in Japan, I think, four or five hundred years ago. It's like the Japanese version of The Art of War. So that's a good read. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, so you have Principles by Ray Dalio, and now you have what, The Book of Five Rings. I got, I got to it's check good, it out. It's pretty cool, yeah. Uh, so written by oh. a Japanese swordsman. Yeah. And what do you read for fun? Oh, the second one was for fun. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll give another more. I don't know. That could be for work. Sorry, I, I I'll give like, it, I'm going to I'll give war. another fun one. I, I, I really enjoyed the three-body problem. So that's one book I'm reading oh, today. Yeah. The science fiction book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a TV series as well. I watched right that. Now. Yeah, that was really good. That was what got me started with the novel. The TV series? Yeah, the TV series. I've, I, 
I mean, I know I haven't got to watch it. It's yet. the one in Mandarin, it just right? Came out, yeah. Like, oh, a... yeah, yeah, the one in Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to watch it, but uh, I will get around to it's it. It's good. You can say you're practicing uh, your Mandarin. It's a great excuse for <laughs> <laughs> spending hours on a TV show. <laughs> you know, you've obviously seen many founders, right, over the past dozen years, right, in Singapore, in Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, over the past dozen yeah. years. And obviously, the average scenario is that the company winds down, right? And you've managed to keep going. A lot of some bunch of other folks. So from your perspective, what do you think differentiates the founders that kind of like keep going versus those that have to kind of like move on to a new chapter? I see a big difference. That's, well, firstly, I want to acknowledge that it's, 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 there's no intrinsic, there, there's nothing bad about moving on to a new chapter. Right? Sometimes I, we've seen founders move on to an, start another company or join another company and, and they make a bigger impact. They grow more and, they, and that's very successful, right? But I think one big difference, a couple of big differences. I think one is, do they have a team that they really enjoy working with? One thing that have really helped me get so far as well is really the team. And that's both my team members, but also our board and the mentors and shareholders that I enjoy just going on this journey with. Because it can be lonely. And, but when you feel down, and if you have a co-founder or, or a board member that, can, that you can talk to, that can help problem solve with you, that goes a long way in keeping you motivated for the long run. So that's one thing that, one pattern I've noticed, which is teams that are really close and they trust each other, they can talk out the problems, they tend to go a long way together and the founders tend to stick on the journey together. The second one is mission, right? If, if they have a clear mission and they're doing, they're very clear about why they're doing this for a purpose larger than that of just serving themselves, then they tend to keep going. One of my favorite stories and favorite books, it's A Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Fankro. And he talks about how mm, yeah. people who survived the concentration camps were those who, who had a kid out there waiting for them or a spouse out there waiting for them or a purpose out there. It can be as simple as them saying, I want to reflect on this journey and share with the, reflect on this experience and share with the world after I get out, right? It's compared to people who are just always thinking about how they can survive for themselves. And it was those who thought about others that, that gave them that motivation and drive to keep on surviving. And I think it's very similar in the startup. If you have a mission that you are living for, that you're fighting for, that's larger than yourself, then that will give you the motivation to keep going when things are tough. Yeah. And when you look ahead in the future, what do you think are the key trends that people should be aware about in tech and in Southeast Asia if you're like a founder? Well, I think the, the first thing now that's top of mind for a lot of people is that there's a big slowdown in the funding environment and many people are wondering, oh, is this a great time to start a startup? Is this a good time to keep building? But I would say it is, right? Because it's, it's, even when we first started, the funding wasn't as, as in abundance as it was the past few years. So, and we saw many great startups of today that started back during those days, 2014, 2015 as well. They're huge today. And I think the ability to thrive in such times of scarcity would really differentiate the great startups from the others. So, so even though this is, a, this is a slowdown in the funding market, it's a slowdown in the business environment, I think it's still a great time to keep building. So I'm still, still feeling very bullish about Southeast Asia. <laughs> and any hobbies that you have personally? I like to do, aside from just the usual exercising and taking care of itself physically. I think meditation is something that I really enjoy. And it has been the one thing that has given me so much more clarity and yeah. the ability to just just step out and have much calmer thoughts. Yeah. When did you first start meditation? On and off since about 10 years ago. But I really started getting more seriously into it about six years ago. And one of the things that I will do is go do silent retreats. So every year, oh. once a year, I would go to this place called Bali Silent Retreat. It's pretty near Ubud. You go there and lock away your phone, no devices, no Wi-Fi, and just spend time with yourself. No talking to anyone as well. And it's, it's like my version of a think week, and I get so much clarity out of that. You know, I've been to Vipassana twice. Oh, the, the 10 days intense uh, one, yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah, the first one I went because I wanted to go with my first co-founder. So we went there as a part of our conscious uncoupling <laughs> process because we took both going our separate ways. <laughs> oh, wow, this, this is really nice. I mean, yeah. Yes, yeah, best friend. Yeah. Second time I went with my wife, just accompany her. Yeah. 
So when you do these retreats, I mean, you said that you started ramping it up about six years mm. ago. Like, what was that reason? Why did you ramp up? Yeah. I think it was the awareness that it's not only just about working hard and going through the grind day after day. That's very important, right? You just got to put in the hours. But it's the awareness that clarity is key, especially when you're building a team and you're leading a team. Because if you're leading 100 people, you're leading 1,000 a, a people, you can be working really hard, but if they're all working on the wrong things, then you're head, just heading off in the wrong direction at a faster velocity, right? So having clarity and making sure that you take a step back to make sure that your team is working on the right thing, you're executing the right strategy. It's one of the reasons why I do these retreats because then that gives me the hate space to really think about things. To make sure that we are working on the right things and there aren't things that we're missing. And when you think about mindfulness and so, so forth, what do you think is Oswald, before Oswald, before learning meditation as a skill versus after? Any big differences in your habits or outlook because of your meditation habit? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I tend to be a lot more reactive in the past. Maybe a larger ego. But I think this habit has really helped me to gain a lot more clarity. That also helped me cultivate what we call the beginner's mindset. There's awareness that, that, that it's not about myself. It's about learning from people. It's about making an impact. Awesome. So I'd love to kind of like summarize the three big key takeaways I got from you. The first, of course, was I think really interesting to hear about how you were founded, well, dropping out. Mm -hmm. And then after that, dropping out for a bad product market fit idea <laughs> and then you slowly iterating pivoting to get somewhere yeah. and i yeah literally you change everything right you change your customer you change your product and you change geographies yeah, and all, right so you did yeah. you did every kind of pivot possible so that was really interesting here that i think inside a point of view about it because i think everybody looks at you and it's, it looks simple now and more obvious in retrospect but i think really interesting to hear that iteration here the second of course is thanks for sharing about I think it was like to choose the market, Indonesia, what you learned about what it like to build for the platform there, but also how to build a team there and how to accelerate the rate of learning and execution, mm -hmm. which is what you needed to succeed. And lastly, I really enjoyed what you shared about the beginner's mindset as well as learning to learn. I thought it was a, I think a wonderful, I don't know, sync between what you're hoping your kids to learn, but also what you yourself practice over time as well. So and that, on that note, thank you so much for sharing, Oswald. Well, thank you, Jeremy. It's great catching up with you. See you around. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave.